You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. The spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. In other words, he's saying, don't get a big head about this. The Lord's using you. He's working through you. And just rejoice in the fact that he's doing that. Because here's the thing that we have to remember. Does Jesus really need me to be here to serve him? Or could he do everything I do himself? He could do it all himself. He chooses to use us and allow us to serve him. And I'm really glad he does. Have you ever stopped to think about the spiritual realm? Hollywood has sensationalized the spiritual realm with their depiction of angels and devils. You've seen them personified as a little angel on one shoulder and a little devil on the other. Today, Pastor Ken helps us truly see what the spiritual world is like. The one thing you will learn is that the spiritual realm is very real and directly affects your daily life. And as we just heard from Pastor Ken a moment ago, God uses you in the physical world daily. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 32, as he begins his message, Touring the Spiritual World with God. Okay, we're still in Ezekiel chapter 32, and Lord willing, we'll get done with it. Uh, But tonight we have a, a tour. The Lord's going to take us on a tour. We're going to tour the spiritual world with God, and He's going to take us through Sheol, uh, and, and really, it's an interesting section of Scripture because it's kind of like God saying, well, over here we got this army, and over here we got that army. And, and we, when we get there, you'll, you'll understand it a little bit. But remember, as we started chapter 32 last week, we saw that we had a lot of the same kinds of markers and the same kinds of things being said as we had seen earlier in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and in Ezekiel 31. And we finally figured out that He's not talking about Egypt again. He's talking about Satan. He's talking about that again. And he's talking about spiritual warfare. It's not just about Pharaoh. It's it's not just about the people of of Egypt, but it's the real power behind the throne. He's talking about the spirit beings that God placed in control of these various nations back in Genesis chapter 11, and the fact that some of them have stopped following God and they're doing their own thing and accepting worship. So, and, and we talked about a picture of that we saw in the book of Daniel, but we've learned that the spiritual warfare is real. And that's the one message that Ezekiel's trying to get across to the nation of Israel who are getting ready to be in exile for 70 years. They didn't take it seriously. They didn't understand that there really are spiritual powers behind all of this, and they thought they could play around with it. The one thing that will be cured as a result of being in exile for the nation of Israel over 70 years is they'll never be idolaters again. That is a problem that they don't have ever again after they return from being in Babylon. But until then, they still have this problem. And that's part of the reason why Ezekiel is concentrating so much in this section of Scripture, uh, talking about the spiritual powers and beings that are behind all of this. Now, as New Testament believers, we kind of see this and We understand sort of what Ezekiel's telling us as he lays it all out and starts showing us the spiritual warfare going on, uh, because we're involved in spiritual warfare on a daily basis too. We see it. We We see it happening in our individual lives. We know that there's some other power out there behind some of the weird things that happen, and we're engaged in real combat. And that's what that's what Ezekiel's trying to get across to the nation of Israel in 500 BC. It's real combat. It, it, this is really stuff that's going on. Ezekiel is making it real and palatable to, the, to those who are around him. He's making sure that they understand that this is real conflict and, and a real combat that they're in. So realizing that was then, well, what about now? Well, Paul talks about now. He talks about it in Romans chapter 13. He says, the night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. He's telling us to put on armor. Did you notice that? That's a combat term. He's he's making sure that we're ready for battle. Let us behave properly as in the day. What day? Well, let's behave properly as if it's the day that Christ is returning is what he's saying. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, 
but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. In other words, don't allow anything to get in the way of the relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't make any provisions for it. And I've seen folks who have done that. You know, well, I, I'm, I'm going to continue to serve the Lord, but I still want HBO on my TV, even though that sometimes drives, draws me astray because of some of the programming that's on it. Or I... Well, that's making provisions for the flesh. You know, or it could be simple. I'm fighting against eating too much. Well, how do you make provisions for the flesh? Well, I have a cabinet full of potato chips. And I really do, and I really am struggling with it, and I'm really trying to not eat them. But, you know, is that a provision for the flesh? Yeah, it is. You know, it, it just, it really is. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul talks a little bit more about it. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord, and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. Again, that combat term, we have to be fully prepared to be engaged in combat of some kind, and so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And he tells us very clearly, that Ezekiel's trying to point the same thing out, Paul's really clear, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. Now, Ezekiel hints at these people, Paul names them. These are spiritual powers, these are titles, these are these are job titles of some of these individuals. Yeah, they, we call them angels, and that's a job title as well. It just means messenger. But these are job titles for these various spiritual individuals we've been talking about in Ezekiel. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. God's taking different sections of his word and he's comparing them to different portions of a uniform that a Roman soldier would be wearing. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you're able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, Notice he doesn't say that they're not flaming arrows. They're all flaming arrows, which is a more dangerous, more hazardous type of weapon uh, that was used in that day and age. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And when he says sword, he uses the same word that's for the short sword used by the Roman soldier, the machaira, and it's for up-close personal combat, and it's, it's so you can be very surgical as to what you want to use it on. And he's saying God's word is the same way. It's, up, it's for up close personal combat. It's for being used to reach people. And, and certain scriptures will reach one person and may not reach another one. But the Lord will use it and the Holy Spirit takes that. That's what he's talking about. So who's the battle against? Ezekiel's been talking to us about this battle. He's referenced the king of Tyre. Now he's talking about Pharaoh. But that's not who the battle is with. The battle is with those spiritual powers that Paul was talking about who are standing behind the throne. Ezekiel's talking about them too. The real, specific, tangible warfare that we're being talked about is in the spiritual realm. We may not see it, but we hear and see hints of it from time to time. And sometimes it shows up in the real world when you start seeing people who are doing incredibly crazy things and you wonder, what's that all about? Because they're nuts. You you just wonder why are they doing what they what they do? You know, a great example was Adolf Hitler. Another great example is the guy in North Korea. We just don't we don't get it. It's an example of spiritual warfare beginning to manifest itself externally in the real world. So what's our role? Are we passive participants? As believers, what does the Bible say that we're supposed to be doing? You know, are we supposed to be on the defensive or on the offensive? Where are we supposed to be on this? What about the role of being on the defensive? And what is the expectation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we engage in this combat? What is it that he wants us to do? And how does he want us to react as we're involved in that? Now, remember when Jesus sent out some of his followers, he sent out, oh, when he was announcing the kingdom, because you have to remember there's a specific point in time that Jesus was saying the kingdom of heaven is come upon you. And then there is a specific rejection that takes place. So how many did he send initially? He sent 70. 70, which is an interesting number. Uh, Luke 10.1 says, After this the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And I find that a very interesting number. 
Back in Genesis 11, when we were studying and looked at that, how many nations were there in the table of nations? There were 70. How many spiritual powers were assigned to oversee these different nations? 70. Why is Jesus sending 70 to announce the coming of the kingdom of God? Well, what he's basically doing is he's telling the spiritual powers, I'm coming for you. I'm assigning enough people to be involved who are forwarding the kingdom of heaven and in the power of the Holy Spirit to take down exactly what everything has been going on the prior several thousand years as they've been messing things up. Now, unfortunately, Jesus, who offered the kingdom at that time to the Jewish nation, they rejected it. Uh, at a point in time yet in the future, they're going to say yes. And when they say yes, that's when he returns and he takes the throne at that point. But we see the number in Deuteronomy 32. It's in the Septuagint, and it says this in the English translation of it. When the Most High distributed nations as he scattered the descendants of Adam, he set up boundaries for the nations according to the number of the angels of God. So he's 70 nations, 70 of these spiritual powers to oversee them. And his people Jacob became the portion of the Lord. So Jacob, then Israel, is the 71st, is what that really accounts to. Israel is an allotment of his inheritance. Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9, when the Most High, and this is the uh, ESV version that says, it says the same thing. He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Your translation may say sons of Israel. It does say that in, in the New American Standard. This is actually in the Hebrew as you look into it. It says sons of God. We've been able to see in the Dead Sea Scrolls it says the same thing, sons of God. So how many nations? Seventy is the number that we saw in Genesis 10 that God set aside due to disobedience. Remember, God said that they were supposed to cover the planet and they were supposed to have lots of children and cover the earth, and they all decided instead, no, we're going to go to this little river valley located near Baghdad. Well, it's not Baghdad today, but it's going to be. And we're going to build a city here, all of us. And they refused to leave. And the only way God finally got them to spread apart is he changed all their language. So the next morning they get up, walk out of their cabin and say hi to the guy next door. And, you know, they, they say hi, and he goes, what's that? You know, it doesn't understand the language anymore. Uh, that that That's one way to get people to move. Psalm 82, remember this is where we see God talking about the divine counsel, those angels that he assigned or those spiritual beings that he assigned to oversee these different nations. And the fact that in Psalm 82 he's saying, well, you didn't do what I asked you to do. And he's announcing judgment that's going to come. God has taken his place in the divine counsel. In the midst of the gods, little g, he holds judgment. Now remember, they all thought they were gods. They were they would like being worshipped like gods, but God's saying you're not. You're the little g. He uses the word Elohim in the in the Hebrew. And he holds judgment. He he asks them a question: How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Well, that's what they were doing. And, and he says it's got to end. So he says, give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, and deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. Now he's talking about them again, this, these powers. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you'll die. What he's telling them is because of their failures, because they've turned against God, they're going to find themselves like unsaved men spending eternity separated from God. They're not going to be killed. They can't be killed. They're eternal beings, but they're going to spend eternity in the same place that was prepared for Satan. And, and that's what he's saying here. And he says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. And he's pointing at that point to what we see in the book of Revelation. Now, the 70 that Jesus sent out, when he sent them out to take down, to start the process of taking back what these 70 angels had screwed up, uh, in Luke chapter 10 he says this, the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus says, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. In other words, he was watching the fact that 
and he's already seeing that what we see in the book of Revelation at the end of the age, that Satan is taken down. And he's already he's saying, you are beginning that process. I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents. Isn't that an interesting name or title that he uses there? Who is the serpent? Satan, Lucifer. And he's, the first thing he says is, I've given you authority to tread on serpents. He's not talking about snakes. He's talking about spiritual beings at that point. And scorpions. I haven't been able to figure out what, the, what that is. Other than a, a strange critter that has a tail that curves, curves around. And over all the power of the enemy. So now all of a sudden we see that again. So we know, and the scorpions have got to be something connected with that. But power over serpents and power over the enemy. He's talking about those spiritual powers and those authorities that Jesus came here to reverse everything for. When he went to the cross, he achieved lots of things to include taking back the deed of the planet Earth, and the book of Revelation is him just taking the deed and opening it. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. In other words, he's saying, don't get a big head about this. The Lord's using you, he's working through you, and just rejoice in the fact that he's doing that. Because here's the thing that we have to remember. Does Jesus really need me to be here to serve him, or could he do everything I do himself? He could do it all himself. He chooses to use us and allow us to serve him, and I'm really glad he does. At, one, at a point in time, though, in the future, he's going to do something all on his own. Because you see in the scripture that when he returns to earth, he says, it's my right hand that takes care of the enemy. He's the one who's going to take care of all those who have come up against Israel and come up against him, and he's just going to say a couple of words and they're done. And that's what it says in the scriptures. But the implications are clear here in this section of scripture uh, that we've been talking about. And that's what Ezekiel's talking about. But Jesus, his ministry specifically was to begin the end for Satan and these princes, these principalities, these powers, these gods, quote, of the nation, he's reversing it all. He's changing it all. And that's what Jesus started. Here in Ezekiel, we're seeing that they still think they have power, but God's already laying out the framework for that to change. So I asked the question earlier, what's the expectation of the Lord Jesus Christ of us as we're engaged in spiritual warfare today? So let's set the stage. This is later in the ministry of Jesus on earth. Now, when Jesus was ministering here on planet earth, he actually moved his base of operations to a place called Capernaum, and that's where he lived and operated from. And if you've ever been in the Middle East in the summertime, when it's 130, it's always nice to be someplace north and where the altitude is a little higher and the temperature is a little lower. So I kind of understand why he did that. I wouldn't want to be there in the summer either. But Jesus has spent all of his time at this point with his disciples, and he's been training them as the, as the kingdom has already been officially rejected by this time. Uh, at a point in time, the nation of Israel rejected it. And when they rejected it is, is a simple thing. They attributed what Jesus was doing to Satan. They said what he did was of Satan. Mark 3, 22 to 30 is that official rejection of the nation. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul. Now, that is the Canaanite name for Baal. Baal is, be, is, is called Beelzebul in, in Canaanite. And it literally means Lord of the dead or Lord of the flies. It's Satan is, is what it is. And they're saying that Jesus was possessed by Satan. And he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And he called them to himself and began speaking them to, into them in parables. The reason why Jesus switched to parables is because if he spoke to them in plain truth, then they would be held accountable for that and their punishment would be heavier. So he starts talking to them in mysteries and in parables to kind of, as a, as a way of showing grace to them and loving them, if they don't understand it, they're not going to be held accountable for it. If they understand it, they're going to be held accountable for it and their punishment will be heavier. So he starts speaking in parables. How can Satan stand, cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he's finished. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder the property 
unless he first binds the strong man, and then he'll plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. They had rejected God and had rejected Christ to the point that after this Jesus is, has nothing to do with them. They have attributed what he does to Satan. And today, as we see, there are people who are not believers, and at a point in time, for many of them, unfortunately, they have reached the point of rejection where God says, okay, you've rejected the Holy Spirit wanting you and telling you and revealing me to you, I'm done. I won't, I won't, I won't do anything that you don't want anymore. And and that's that's what he's talking about here. Now, if I've met people before who think that they have they may, they have, may have committed the unpardonable sin, if you think you have, rest assured you haven't, because you wouldn't be worried about it if you had. You would be rejecting God and be walking away. But this is what he's talking about. He's talking about those people who have rejected, and specifically the Pharisees and the religious leaders who had just said, everything you do is of Satan. And he's going, okay, that's it. I'm done with you. So at this point, not here, but after the rejection, Jesus has spent six months with his disciples pretty much off to the side. He's trying to keep away from the public eye so he can train them because he knows where, that he's going to leave. And he asks a question of these, of these companions who have been with him almost three years. And it's a real simple question. But where he does it and how he does it is very intriguing, and it gets back to what we're seeing here in Ezekiel. Ezekiel says these are there are powers behind all of this, and it's Satan. And Jesus is in the process of trying to recover all of that. In Matthew 16, verses 13 to 19, it says, Now Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. Remember that place. That's north of Capernaum. It's just a little bit south of Mount Hermon. It's in a place called Bashan, which for an Israelite living in Israel in 30 AD is demon central. Uh, and another name for Caesarea Philippi is Pania, meaning the house of Pan. So this is where they're, they're going to. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? So he asks this question. And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. Now, the next word, a lot of our friends in the Catholic Church say, and Peter's being appointed Pope. But we're not there. We don't see what Jesus is pointing to. But you have to remember, where is he? He's in Demon Central. And he, in fact, the, the altar of Pan was considered the gates of hell. So Jesus is probably standing right in front of it, possibly. And he says, on this rock, I'll build my church. He's actually pointing to all of the stuff that's around him, saying, the people who are going to be saved are coming out of this. And the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not overpower it. Now, we take that to mean one thing, but Jesus has something else in mind. We'll talk about that. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking to Paul. He's talking to all of us as believers that we have the opportunity to share Christ with others. And as a result, we open up heaven to somebody who's given their life to the Lord because we've shared him with them. We're so glad you tuned into today's edition of The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken. For more information about this ministry and what we believe, you can find all you need to know at theunsafebible.com. Want to hear more messages from Ezekiel? We've got that too. Just look under the media tab. Again, our website is theunsafebible.com. As you've been listening to this teaching in Ezekiel, what are some of the things that come to mind? Do you struggle with unresolved sins in your life? Have you found yourself wondering why your life isn't going as planned? Can you imagine what it would be like to be exiled from paradise and to be told it was all your fault? 
That's the truth that Ezekiel had to deliver to the Jews from Babylon. It took 70 years, but they finally accepted their sin as their own and returned in faith to God. Where are you on that journey? No matter what the circumstances are, you must seek God in all things to ensure a singular focus on the one true God. We want you to find strength in your faith. And if you need help or have questions, you can contact us directly at theunsafebible.com. Just click on the Connect tab and the Connect card. Fill it out and we'll get in touch with you. If you're in the Jupiter, Florida area, we want to invite you to our next worship service. Directions can be found on the About tab by clicking the word Contact. We hope to see you soon. Well, that's all the time we have for today. But we want to invite you back again next for more encouraging and uplifting messages by Pastor Ken right here on The Unsafe Bible.